Hey, good day everybody and welcome back to the Air Warfare Group. My name is Juice and today on Bottle to Throttle we're, ha we're hosting our first guest, our actual real guest. Uh, the, the first episode was Tyro and I introducing the series Bottle to Throttle. And today our first episode for real, probably episode two in, in, in the series, but our first episode involving an actual guest is today's guest is Lieutenant Colonel Walter Flint, U.S. Air Force retired. Colonel Flint, welcome. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate you hosting me here at your beautiful home with your uh, beautiful family. And thanks. And uh, glad to have it's, you. It's an honor to be your first real guest, <laughs> whatever <laughs> well, that means. You know, we've we've been uh, we've been in contact since we lost contact through the military after both of us retired. We've been in contact. Uh, for about for almost just over the last year, I think we 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 kind of met up online through a mutual associate in the airlines uh, that you fly for. Uh, we met up with them in um, uh, th through him in January February of last year, and worked out great because you live uh, about six hours north of here uh, in Bellingham, and I just happened to be hiking through Washington State last year, and you were actually able to come and do logistics for us. Uh, uh, for me and my buddies, and join us on part of the trip in two different legs. That was pretty yeah, fun. Yeah, it actually fulfilled one of the things on my bucket list, which which was to walk a good portion of the Pacific Crest Trail. So thank you very much for helping me out with that. Well, as soon as you retire from the airlines in a few years, I think then we'll be able to do like longer sections together because that's what I I like the PCT. Uh, as a matter of fact, for those of you who aren't aren't aware, uh, Colonel Flint and I are going to be doing part of the Pacific Northwest Trail uh, if everything works out with our schedules and stuff this year. But that's all, that's for another episode. So before we get started, I, I probably should mention to our viewers that the opinions and experiences and views and uh, at bad attitudes that we exhibit here do not reflect those of the U.S. Air Force, uh, the Department of Defense, or any of the other components that we've worked with in our, in our uh, 20 years plus of federal service. Uh, so if we say something here, it doesn't represent anything except our own opinions and our own attitudes towards uh, our experiences. You know, basically, you know, this is the way we saw it. This is the way we experienced it. Which which could change, I guess, throughout the show with the bottle <laughs> part of your bottle to throttle. It's probably a good good disclaimer to put in there. Yeah. Now, uh, this is bottle to throttle. Typically, what we do is we get together and share a drink. But we are you are getting ready to fly today, so we actually had our drinks yesterday, and we. Um, uh, I know still you're, recovering from that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we started off. We I made us each an aviation. Uh, because we had to have one of those. That was the first drink we featured. And then we uh, we transitioned to some Belgian-style uh, ales that we picked up at the local store. And you were apprehensive at first about those ales. Yeah. <laughs> you want to well, tell us why, why uh, you yeah, felt that way? Of course, uh, I spent uh, part of the latter half of my career in Europe, and specifically in Belgium, as a as a uh, officer at uh, U.S. NATO and uh, working as a liaison to the European Union and to NATO, mm -hmm. and uh, so I got to spend uh, quite a bit of time sampling the uh, Belgian cuisine, the chocolate, the fries, and most importantly the the Abbey and Trappist ales that they make there in Belgium. That I I personally think there's nothing that comes close in the rest of the world. So when we're you know I guess I've turned into in part into a little bit of a beer snob having spent uh, so much time in germany and belgium and oh, so sure. when i come back to the come back to the states and they say a belgian like or belgian type ale I, i'm a bit skeptical to say the least to start with when it's a it's a u.s label and not actually sure. from uh, from an abbey or or uh in uh, belgium or one of the famous trappist ales that they have over there yeah i would have to agree i've i've been in some places where i've had uh the real San Miguel beer, and then you get the imitation stuff made in Mexico. So, hey, so uh, you know, we were talking when we caught up uh, after not seeing each other for almost 20 years or working with each other, and we were catching up, and and you got to tell me the story about how you became a pilot. Uh, oh gosh! And and you really uh, you went to you weren't you didn't go to ROTC. Were you, oh I don't know. Were you in ROTC at all? Did no, you? no. I, by the time I checked out to. Uh, ROTC, seriously, I was already a junior, and they really, the shortest program they think they had at a time was two-year program, and they uh, they didn't seem to really be interested in me at that uh, at that point in time, uh, and so I didn't think much more about it until I got close to graduation in, in my uh, my fifth year of college, 
Yeah. When I realized I had to do something after I graduated. And uh, that's when I walked into the recruit. I just walked in off the street to the recruiter and said, Hey, I, I want to be a pilot, you know? Uh, and I hadn't really, I hadn't thought a lot about it before then, as far as being a military pilot, I'd already had my, uh, my private license, of course, uh, having grown up and be lucky enough to have access to an airplane. And, and there it is. That was actually the, uh, really the first airplane I ever flew right there. And it was a seaplane. And it, my dad owned that. He was a, he was an instructor. And so I had lots of opportunities to, uh, to fly that airplane and learn to fly in a seaplane. And I had to actually, uh, when I did get serious about it to get my private license, had to actually transition to a wheel plane to do that. And there, there that is. Yeah, that's, that's the 150. Me. Who is that guy with the hair? <laughs> and, 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 and no belly. No belly. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah we, we definitely uh, show our maturity, both of us. That's me. That's actually after I had my private license. And I, I used that uh, sexy machine behind me there to, to pick up chicks and <laughs> fly, fly them out uh, for dinner somewhere. It worked quite well, actually. Was, awesome. Uh, that was fun. You know, when I'd get some spirits back in that back then, it, was, it wasn't quite as expensive as it is now to... Yeah. to rent an airplane and fly it but uh but that was a lot of fun anyway um so i had my private license um and uh and just went into the recruiter there at dara down in seattle i went to the you know i'd initially started out believe it or not in in bellingham at western washington university as a music major music composition uh but a couple of years into that i realized that you know why do i need a degree that says i can play music i really wasn't uh, serious at that time about teaching i just wanted to play but yeah and you were in a band that, at the time too, right? Oh yeah, I got a college I, I rock little, band or little folk. little groups here and there, and and I uh, but I didn't didn't think I needed a college degree that said I I, I could play music. So I uh, and I realized that I was never going to be as good as, as some of these professional musicians you see that they <laughs> they can barely make a living doing it. It's what they love, and and I thought, well, I can I can still play music as a hobby. So I got serious about uh, about a degree and thought, well, I'd go into the aeronautical engineering uh, program down at the University of Washington, which, of course, is one of the best in the nation. And so I transferred to the University of Washington. I uh, did that for a, a couple of years. I, I had a girlfriend at the time whose dad was an engineer for Boeing. So I actually got to see what the Boeing engineers did for a living. And I had this idea about being a Chuck Yeager or uh, Burt Rutan and going out yeah. designing my own airplane and flying it. and uh, realize that's not what it is at all. And of course, this was in the days just prior to computer assist assisted design. And so it was more like uh, uh, a Dilbert cartoon where you're in a cubicle uh, in some big office designing a nut that goes out on the wing of some airplane that's going to fly 20 years from now. And I realized that that, uh, that wasn't something I wanted to do for a living. I'm more of a hands-on sort of person. And uh, so I was, a, I was a bit disheartened. And, and of course, myself now would tell my, my younger self, just get the degree and be done with it. But I, of course, thought at the time, well, I've got to get a degree in something that's useful. Yeah. So what did you end so, up transition, transitioning so, to? What, what well, was the final well, degree? Go, yeah, yeah. It's kind of, you know the answer to this, and I know yeah. you're goading it out of me. But, uh, you know, you take, you t I went to the counselor there, and you take, uh, you take music and the humanities and the liberal arts, and you mix that with the sciences and engineering, two years of each, and what do you get? Well, anthropology, of course. <laughs> And uh, so awesome. my degree, I ended up, I ended up getting a degree in in social anthropology, which, at first, doesn't sound at all like something that would be useful, uh, certainly to flying or, or in the air force. But the reality is, it does have some benefits there. It, I actually, uh, it actually was useful in training your mind to try to think uh, outside of your own paradigm and kind of look at things from other other people's perspectives, and that's very useful, especially uh, in the military community. Yeah, and this really, was this when, was right around 1985, 86 time frame when you when uh, you were transitioning. Right, yeah, eight, eight, 85 was uh, was when I graduated. Right, and, uh, right as computers were. I mean, computer <laughs> uh, engineering degrees were coming out. Uh, you know, aeronautical engineering degrees were favored for. You know, you look at all those Air Force Academy grads <laughs> or the Navy Academy grads. Uh, where are these? You know, aerospace degrees. You know, focused right. things. And here's the. These are the guys that you're competing with at pilot training. Yeah, I was probably the only anthropology major there at the time, <laughs> but yeah. I'd already had my uh, my private license when I when I joined the Air Force, um, and uh, and so I didn't have to go through the initial flight screening program that they had at the time. They called it 
lovingly called it fish pot. And that was a Cessna 172 that screened out uh, some of the folks that they oh, just yeah. didn't think were cut out for, for flying. And it's funny, you know, you really can't tell until you put a person in the cockpit uh, how they're going to handle it. It, it. Whether they're, they could be a, a really analytical, uh, high IQ engineer or just some farm boy off the uh, off the farm and and and, he, and sometimes the, of course the farm boy can fly circles around the engineer because he knows how to improvise and think on his feet whereas the engineer you can you can actually be too analytical sometimes in some circumstances and so it really uh you got to put them in the in the uh in the cockpit to really see uh to see how they handle it yeah i don't know really what can't. the i don't know what the uh, current train of thought is uh when looking at pilots but you know when i was in and we were training young pilots for survival and for uh emergency escape and all of the air crew life support sides of it we always noticed that the guys that were left and right brain balanced, the ones that could use both parts of their brain, were the best ones at learning spatially and analytically how to do something. Yeah, yeah, I think there's definitely something to that. Yeah, definitely. And, so, and, and when we get to it a little bit later on, that, we, that plays a big part into in the uh, sure interview with the U2 as well, getting yeah. getting selected into the U2 program. So we, uh, we, we we catch up, fast forward, it's 1986, you get commissioned, you go to OTS, I believe? OTS, 90 yeah. Day Wonder. Yeah, was that Medina Base down in San Antonio? At, at, yeah, at that time it was in San Antonio, so I spent yeah. a lot of time Just in, outside uh, of in Texas. Just outside of there, yeah. Yeah, in San Antonio, and, Ra and then of course Randolph at a later time, and Del yeah. Rio, and and that. now this is a Willy Jet, but you started when you went through pilot training. You went to Del Rio or Laughlin Air Force Base down off right, the, right across the right. border from Mexico. That's the mighty Tweet T thirty seven. They're built by Cessna. Cessna. This it's, is it's probably the fastest built. Cessna before well the, before the Citation <laughs> in the it's, Mustang. It's slightly, it's slightly faster than a Cessna one seventy two. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but the jets at, uh, at Laughlin looked exactly like this. They had a big XL on the tail, but they were the white white jets, and they call them lovingly the Tweet because they are they sound they have a very loud high yeah. whistle. Sound, uh, they don't fly sound like you're flying a vacuum now. cleaner. Yeah, these are all gone now. Yeah, they but even had combat versions of these, the uh, A thirty seven yeah. Dragonflies. Right, right. Yeah, these are these are gone, and uh, but uh, but nonetheless played a very important part in the first primary jet trainer that. Uh, yeah, all uh, Air Force pilots flew at that time, going through, up until they uh, they went to the two track system and introduced the T six. Yeah, and uh, I would have to say your your level of training that you went through, the program that you went through, was not really the one point oh because one point oh goes all the way back to Orville Wright, but you were probably in the one point seven days before the new two point oh came out, as far as pilot yeah, training. Every, yeah, when I went through every, and, and of course when I went back as an instructor, everybody uh, went through the two two jets. We we everybody went through the ground training. They went through the T thirty seven, and then they all went to the T thirty eight. And this and makes sense was... because the T thirty seven is a side by side jet. It's a lot slower, so you don't have a, a, as many chances to kill yourself as you do in the T thirty eight. But it allows the instructor to observe you instead of being stuck in the back seat where you can't see what you're doing. I was I was going to say it allows the instructor to physically intervene with you and <laughs> smack you upside the head. But that's uh, that's old fashioned CRM as well. So. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that's a uh, we used to in the enlisted world we called it wall to wall counseling. <laughs> The the other unique thing about the T thirty seven, of course, is it was spinnable. You could actually, uh, and they and they the Air Force oh, course wanted that. They wanted to teach pilots how to spin, and so you actually had to do a spin recovery to uh, get the airplane out of the spin, and uh, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I can it was, see where it was kind of ter terrifying at first, but you get used to it, and it actually becomes something that's kind of fun. Did having an elevated T tail help you in a spin recovery? It seems like you would get good airflow over the elevator up there. I think that probably had something to do with it. Uh, of course, I didn't get my degree in aerial engineering, so I can't uh, analyze it for you. I can yeah. talk from an anthropological point of view, but yeah. I, but I as a, a pilot, it, yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, or possibility. To, I noticed there's like a, a wind vane or a pressure vane there right before the forward of the intakes leading out to the radome or well what would where, where, where a radome would be in a radar aircraft. Uh, what is that line that's right underneath? It's right above the U.S. Air Force on the nose. Oh yeah, those little strikes. Uh, I think I think that was to help provide some stability. I don't know if those ma were maintain airflow know. into the intakes. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if those were on the original aircraft that came out or whether they were added later. I just yeah. don't remember. This is a twin-engine uh, airplane, correct? It is. It's yeah. a twin, but they're it's pretty underpowered. Uh, surprisingly, they're 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 old. You know, of course, this was uh, designed in the 
late 50s, early 60s. I can't remember when they first took delivery, but it was sure. pretty early on. I know they and, had uh, them so as uh, combat aircraft in Vietnam. The, the yeah, yeah, but so. I think I believe the, that version had uh, souped-up uh, engines in it that were a little bit more powerful than the trainers. Yeah. Same seat um, as the T-38? Uh, no, no, they're different. Uh, T-38, uh, th these, uh, you actually had to have some altitude and airspeed to survive an ejection in. Uh, the T-38, I think you could, in theory, uh, eject on the ground, but you had to have... Uh, yeah, it was like a 0-60. Yeah, you had to have some forward motion. Now, for yeah, a guy my size... I didn't want to ever flight test that because yes. uh, that sounded pretty close to me, and unfortunately, I never had to. Yeah, you're pretty um, tall. That the air that that air that seat's going to need a little bit more oomph. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so you go through you first go through tweets, and then you get transferred to talons. We don't have any white pictures of talons, but we'll we'll get some of those for the next interview. Um, okay. But we do you do have we'll, we will skip forward to we'll, we'll skip back to talons when we talk about your time coming back to instructor, but you track through you graduate and you get selected for bombers yeah in fact this was my first choice i felt really lucky to uh, get the b-52 at the time it was kind of the heyday for the b-52 middle of the cold war we were still flying low level we were doing fighter intercepts we had the nuclear mission and the conventional mission so i was really happy my idea at the time was hey i wanted to fly the b-1 that was coming online but they weren't selecting anybody out of pilot training for for that at the moment so i thought well I'll go into the B-52 and it'd be easier to move laterally to the B-1. As it turns out, I decided I didn't want to do that. And the Air Force had other plans for me anyway. But uh, really felt pr privileged to be able to fly this aircraft. The taxpayers certainly have got their money's worth out of it. And it was really special to be able to have a hard crew of six crew members at that time. Uh, we had the gunner, of course, who was enlisted, uh, the electronic warfare officer, uh, the radar navigator, the navigator and then of course the two pilots the co-pilot and the aircraft commander yeah uh, quite a machine and and uh and i wouldn't have traded that opportunity for anything yeah out of your say a thousand or so hours in the b-52 i think you you got most of those hours were in the right seat uh correction the left yeah seat. yeah yeah I, I, no no, no the right, seat. The right, right seat yeah i was i was a i was a co-pilot for most of the time it was right at the end i i had upgraded that and then shortly thereafter got uh got transferred to fly the T-38. It was kind of funny because at that time, the, the upgrades were just not coming very fast from the right seat to the left. And uh, about four and a half years into it, they also started shutting down some other bases. And so we got an influx of additional pilots into the aircraft at our base and it, right. and it bumped those of us that had been there down even farther, which was, yeah. which was uh, like I said, a bit disheartening. So some of us decided to put in our dream sheets, what they had at the time. It was a form that you could fill out volunteering to go back to Air Training Command and fly uh, fly either the T-37 or the T-38. And I uh, usually what how that worked is the co-pilots would go back and be an instructor in the T-37 and the aircraft commanders would go back and be an instructor in the T-38. Mm -hmm. So I put the, I put that sheet in and didn't think anything more about it. Never heard anything from anyone. And, and, and before long, they actually uh, upgraded me into the, uh, into the left seat. Uh, and I was, I was the newest, uh, newest uh, aircraft commander in, in the B-52 at KI Sawyer Air Force Base. And, one morning, uh, following the mass of squadron D or squadron briefing, morning brief, the uh, commander calls me into his office, and I thought, "Oh, oh, oh what am I? Do what did I do now? I had just recently uh, quit being a member of the officers' club because they required <laughs> you to have have a credit card." And I thought he's gonna he's gonna chew me out for quitting the officers' club. Well, that wasn't it at all. In fact, he didn't really care about that. He asked me how, how I felt about going to uh, air training command and being an, a T thirty eight instructor and I told him, well, well, sir, I just upgraded. I'd kind of like to be a uh, aircraft commander in the B-52 a bit longer. And that's when he, after, you know, pulls my dream sheet from six to eight months earlier out of his desk and puts it on his desk. And he says, but it says here you volunteered to do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, ha he had to provide a, an aircraft commander to go down and fly a T-38. So that, that guy was me. And so uh, before long, I'm on the road from Upper Michigan down to Del Rio, Texas. In fact, it was right uh, in, right uh, during the time the first bombs were falling for Desert Storm One in in January. Oh yeah, one. over yeah. And so and so you can imagine I was a bit frustrated about missing out on that. Oh yeah, because uh, yeah. because we did have some opportunity to go over there, and I wanted to actually do an operational mission because everything up to that point had been all training. 
Yeah, but, I was uh, at like Fairchild I, during that time frame, and we sent yeah. guys from. Uh, I I actually moved from the Air, uh, from the Air Force Survival School over to SAC during that time frame, uh, right after the war started, and uh, we sent uh, our bombers to Diego Garcia. But we should back up before we go into the uh, Air Training Command instructor slot again. We should go back up. So you spent a lot of time in the the co-pilot seat first, yeah, which is yeah, the natural yeah. natural process, uh, and w so you've got the aircraft commander in but it's not always assumed that the aircraft commander is flying the airplane, but you had a particular story you told me about uh, managing eight engines. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, in fact, this that actually happened uh, when I was a pretty new co-pilot. I, I think I'd only been there for maybe, I don't even know if I'd been there six months, but I was still uh, either senior second lieutenant, brand new first lieutenant, I can't remember. Uh, and flying with, we were doing, uh, this was actually probably the first emergency I'd experienced in, in an aircraft. In At Air KI, aircraft. flying out of KI. Yeah, yeah. We were, and we were actually uh, in the pattern at, at KI doing uh, touch and go landings. And uh, I wasn't with my hard crew. I was with uh, just uh, an instructor was in the left seat. He was an old crusty uh, major Vietnam era. Uh, flying in the left seat, I was in the right seat, and of course the navigators are downstairs hanging on for dear life. I don't, uh, and uh, I think I think we'd had the 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 rest of the crew with us because we might have gone out and done some other stuff before we were in the pattern there. But uh, anyway, the the uh, the instructor in the uh, left seat is doing a, a touch and go, and of course in the B fifty two, it's kind of a long process. Once you're on the on the runway, you reset the trim, you reset the flight controls, you have to stand up the power and of course it's my job as the pilot not flying to kind of balance out the exhaust uh, pressure ratio on each engine the EPR gauges so you'd look at the EPR and you'd make sure they were all uh, where they were supposed to be uh, uh, before he pushed the power all the way up uh, to, to do the uh, to do the touch and go well I'm looking at the EPRs and number eight I see uh, the engine instruments rolling back to nothing and I, of course, had to kind of blink my eyes and go, is this really happening? Did I just see an engine quit on the runway? And I, 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 it just seemed surreal to me at the time. And he goes to push the power up. And I said, kind of in a meek uh, co-pilot voice, I go, abort. And he look, kind of looks at me with this, uh, if looks could kill sort of thing. And like what? Continues to, continues to push the power up. And, and I go, abort. I say it a little bit louder. Uh, he doesn't do it. He just keeps going. And of course, in the B-52, when one engine fails, even if even an outboard engine like number eight, it, you can't really feel it at first. It, it's you got all those other engines going. It's not really a, a, in that situation a, a super noticeable event. So, and I don't know what possessed me at that time, but I, he didn't abort. And so I took the drag chute lever and I popped the drag chute, which of course commits us to aborting. He is not going to be able to go now. Yeah, unless and you he, cut it away. He, he he looked over at me and slammed the throttles to idle and put up the air brakes and just yelled at me, you better effing be right, go. Yeah. And, 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 of course, my heart comes out of my mouth, and I think this is the end of my Air Force career. And the whole rest of the crew is completely silent because he said it loud enough that they could hear him. <laughs> you know, as and, you're looking uh, at this, if, if you're facing forward, engine number eight is on your right side. So as you're looking at the bomber that's banking, coming at us, that's the engine that's all the way over there by the light, by the wing light. It, it, it is. It is. But, of course, we were, you know, I think we were probably, uh, I don't remember, but it wasn't something that you could necessarily feel right away unless, you know, in that situation. Yeah. And you're following the bold um, face, right? The bold face yeah, text. Yeah, ex exactly. Uh, you know, you got an engine that quit. Hey, we're we should probably stop. Yeah, you need to, um, you know, fix the problem before you fly again because, you know, that first engine might be a series of problems that's coming up, and it's only just now you're getting indication. Well, and anyway, I, I saw those engine indication, but I, but he he was not happy about that, and I thought my on my uh, my short air first career is over before it started. But uh, as we uh, slow down and he goes to pull off the uh, the runway, he kind of looks over and studies. The, he, he has a chance now to look in and study the the engine instruments, and looks over at me and he goes, "Good job, Co." Oh, and that's I, I, wow! I, that's awesome. I cannot I cannot tell you how how good that felt. To, to have made the right decision and kind of hung it out and just, you know, popped out that chute with this old crusty guy there. And this is course, a, uh, this is before we really started having CRM training. Yeah. The CRM, like I said before, was, was abuse and uh, ridicule. Yeah. yeah uh, you either made it or you didn't. Yeah. So now this is, this is just a snapshot of a KI uh, bomber. 
uh, yeah. with uh, with the, it's a good representation of the number of folks that it took to put that thing in the air. I think this is all the the maintenance and life support and uh, and admin and of course the pilots, navigators, gunners. This is pretty much everybody that's yeah. in the squadron and the and the help there that. Uh, I've been in one or two of these pictures at Fairchild where I'm one of the guys in fatigues down below and all the wing is loaded with all of our pilots in the 325th yeah. bomb squadron. Yeah, I had yeah. an opportunity to get up there. You don't get to get up on top very often, but it really illustrates how massive this uh, this machine is. It's huge. And, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and then you know like you said you said dedicated crew or you know is this a crew? Yeah. Hard crew. Uh, and you, I see you've got a picture of our of our crew patch in the lower left hand corner. That yeah. patch was de actually designed by our crew, and we uh, sent it in, and and that's the patch we wore to to show that we were R twenty two. Yep. Uh, and we uh, I still have a couple of those to this day. And I, this remember, also, also I, I remember. I remember like, our uh, hard crews had patches like that, and I also remember that uh, at one point the Air Force allowed them to bring back nose art on the b-52 yeah, in fact this matched our nose art we had the nose art with the pirate uh, and the skull and crossbow flag on our uh, airplane that, yeah the that one assigned ours. to your crew yeah because yeah, like in a yeah. fighter you get you, you usually have the crew chief assistant crew chief and one or two pilots names on a fighter whereas in the b-52 world they don't just have the pilot's name they have the whole crew's name oh for sure or and the, the, and, or the and crew I, crew patch I still remember the tail number to this day. It was aircraft 1019-1019. And the wow, one wow. in the front denoted that it was uh, the aircraft was bought and paid for in 1961. Wow. So that was uh, that was actually, I believe, the last year they uh, they built B-52s. The new, the new ones were coming off the line. So I think the last ones were probably delivered in 61-62. This is a... <laughs> That's a Plitz goggles, and those are used uh, for uh, the B-52s that had the nuclear mission uh, to protect uh, the pilot from flash uh, blindness, and it is a uh, protection from thermal nuclear explosions. They would uh, uh, instantly uh, darken the uh, the uh, eye, the visual area there, to protect the eyes from uh, any nuclear detonations. Yeah, they. Uh, I was gonna. I was gonna let you explain this. I used to work on these in. Uh, the Plitz goggles, if you look at that bracket, that crow's foot that's on your helmet there that we used to call it when locked yeah. in, you can actually see the two contact bars up there that power the device. So when you right. put it on there, the power is running through your comm cord or through an electrical cord that runs through your helmet. And uh, that device is powered with aircraft power. So it's in theory, it technically is supposed to uh, detect the flash when it happens and quickly adjust the 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 yeah. wafers in, in the theory. little yeah and those those wafers that was kind of like a liquid crystal display it's kind of like the you know for those of you who have a modern new age um rear view mirror on your car when a car comes up behind you that senses the light and a light sensor and it's supposed to sh dim your mirror down so you don't get blinded by the light behind you now, now you said in theory t you want to tell them about the extra support gear we used to pack in there for you Oh my gosh, we had a we had a lot. Uh, oh, I'm I'm talking about I, with the Plitz goggles. What came with the Plitz goggles? Oh, the eye patch with the Plitz goggles. Because <laughs> well? yeah. this was it never was tested. The, yeah. Nobody ever volunteered to go look at a, a nuclear explosion with these. I guess. No, no. Unfortunately, we never had to test that either. And yeah, I, I can't you. remember whether we had to draw straws who wore the eye patch and who wore the Plitz goggles. I don't know. I think I, I do th remember. I that, think you're uh, supposed to wear the eye patch underneath the Plitz goggles. Yeah, I just don't. I, don't I think that's how we used to train. You had to put on the iPad. You were still flying monocular, uh, in and stuff. But it was in case the goggles failed, you still had one good eye to fly home with. <laughs> so, and then we had, yeah. and you were issued two pair for co-pilot and pilot because everybody else didn't have windows in the in the jet. Everybody yeah, else was in right. a dark room. That's right. So. That's right. We were the only only ones with a view. And oh, c c quickly go back to it. Yeah, I think I also remember if if we ever had to eject and we had a controlled ejection, we had to remove those before yeah. the ejection. Yeah. And I know the same was true with the night vision. They're pretty heavy. The MVGs, They're pretty heavy. Because if you if you tried to eject with those things on, it would snap your neck. Because well, there was a little little bit of weight to them. They weren't as heavy as the NVGs, but uh, well, but plus I think it definitely could pull your neck down. You know, you guys in buffs were also, I remember the weights, uh, the lightweight 55P helmet, even though you had the same helmet as a fighter guy did, your visor was a lot heavier because you had, you guys did low level, so you had a clear visor for, for to protect your eyes from bird strikes at low level at nighttime, and then you had the shaded visor for all the sun Yeah, use. 
the double visor. And in fact, I still I still took that into the T38 yep. with me. You'll see it in the next picture. But yeah, that was why it was very important during the ejection to put your head all the way back against that red uh, yeah, headrest the head there rest. to keep your keep your head back so it didn't snap forward between your legs as you're as you're ejecting the aircraft. Yeah, and I believe the procedure when we used to train people is that for ejection we we'd say, "Hey, if you've got a if you've got a controlled ejection or you've got an anticipated ejection where you've got time to go through and secure things up, uh, we said drop both visors. Make sure you have both visors down. Just give you that double protection when you go up and hit that slipstream." Yeah, and for stuff. sure. So are we ready to move forward to the T-38 Please, section? Yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, so let's this this is where we started to get to about you going yeah, back to Del Rio yeah, by the so, sea. Uh, so I got the, it was kind of a non-vol in a way because I hadn't expected to, to leave the B-52 when I did at that point. But uh, honestly, one of the best things ever happened to me going to going to be an instructor in the T-38 at Del Rio. I... Uh, it was, a, it was really fun to instruct the students, and it actually, uh, I would say, markedly improved my piloting skills to become an instructor. Yeah, it was good that uh, you, you didn't stay the, in the can, buff program because yeah, that was a shrinking yeah. program. Yeah, you can see the double visor there, too. I have the double yep. visor on as well. With the, yep. uh, the controls the for those are on where you use your thumbs right above the bayonet receivers to slide right. which one down. You push in on it, spring-loaded, and you can slide it up yeah. and down. So, so this is yeah. you in the back seat. How many hours in the back seat? I mean, you you told me you got a lot of landings from back seat. Yeah, yeah. I I honestly would have to look. It's definitely uh, I don't know somewhere in the ballpark of two thousand hours in the T thirty eight. But I I'd have to look to see specifically. Yeah, yeah the probably fifteen hundred of that as an instructor. Yeah, you spend a lot of time learning to land in the back seat. It's a little it's a little bit different than the front. You got a lot better visibility in the front, of course. Uh, in the back seat, of course, when you flare the T thirty eight, you're going to aero brake. And you're also got the nose coming up, and so you can't necessarily see uh, uh, right what's right in front of the aircraft on yeah. the front when you got the nose flared up. So it, it kind of so, preps you for flying a tail dragger in a way. So on rollout or in aero braking, are you watching the HSI to see if you're keeping your alignment, runway no, alignment? No, yeah, I'd say. Or just looking more, out your you're, peripheral. Yeah, you use your peripheral to just stay stay in the center of the runway. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's what that's what I would uh, use mostly, and then you lower the nose, and of course you can see just fine. So your second time in Laughlin, uh, Del Rio, yeah. Texas, right on the border, <laughs> yeah, and you're there for a while. Uh, yeah, because when I graduated, of course everybody says, "Oh, I'm never going back to that place." Yeah. You're out of there, and then of course five years later, here we come again. Yeah, I said that about but, Korea. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been about uh, about three years there, um, and uh, applied for the. Uh, U two while I was in uh, in uh, Laughlin, it's a it's a special duty assignment. So you have to uh, volunteer and you have to submit a package, a fairly extensive package, yeah. uh, to, for them to select you to go to the U two. They aren't going to send somebody there from you know non vol or just assign a, a new pilot to the U two at that at that time. It was a you know you had to be a uh, the pilot. You had to have pilot and command hours of some major weapon system, and you had to have a good good evals and. Yeah. Um, submit a letter as to your motivation and then they'd of course select you to go to the the u2 and you'd go out for a for an interview and it's a two-week interview process so it's, it takes it, it takes quite a bit of time you got to go out there for out to beale air force base in california for for two weeks and uh the first week is all uh meeting and greeting and uh meeting with everyone from the uh ops officers of the squadrons all the way up through the wing commander and it's honestly just as much for that person who's interested in the program to really decide if that's what they want to do yeah it's a, two, it is it's a them, two-way process to, yeah is it you know first of all they want to get to know this person and say is this somebody we can work with if this somebody is really squared away to be able to do this mission it's a it's a very different mission from a lot of the other uh, air force missions and it's gonna it, you know in a way at least at that time it kind of stigmatized you and you went off on a different track that was not really the normal air force um in fact one of my interview questions i'll, I'll just say when i was when i was in the role of the squadron commander was do you how do you feel about not being promoted uh you know is this is that something that you have an aspiration in the air force and if their answer was hey i really want to be a general officer or even i really want to be a colonel i said well you might want to think twice then about coming to the u2 because uh, not everybody gets promoted out of this program and, and that's really true yeah. And so it has to be something where they're motivated more by the flying and the mission than it is than they are by their career aspirations in the Air Force. Yeah, and, and I know a... the, Air, the Air Force has tried to change that a bit, but uh, and I and I can't tell you what it's like now. But at that time, 
there were definitely a lot of good uh, officers that never made it past uh, major or lieutenant colonel just because of uh, where they were and, and the oddity of this uh, fantastic mission. You know, I think everybody involved with this mission uh, was kind of had to go through a special selection process. Uh, you know, for everybody from the maintainers, I mean, if, if you didn't cut it, you didn't stay in the program. And that was not just on the piloting side. That was on all the ops side. Uh, you, I think when you went through this, the jet jet time you had to have was 1,500 hours minimum. Was that about yeah, right? I, I, that sounds about right. I, do, I don't honestly remember the specifics uh, of it. We can go back to the other one there. I'll sure. The, yeah. Um, but yeah, you had you had to submit your evaluations. You had to submit your your log books, your time in, oh, yeah. in your in the type of aircraft you flew, and then also I think you had to have some letters of recommendation as well, uh, among some other things. Um, Did you have I to like take a psyche valve? Um, no, not beforehand, but of course it, during the interviews, of course, they're, they're evaluating what you're like and you've yeah. got questions you can ask to really judge that person. Yeah. And then of course the second week, uh, if you get past the interview process, the second week is the flying, you get three flights, uh, to decide and that you fly with, uh, with the, with, uh, dedicated instructors and they, uh, evaluate how you handle the aircraft and, and how you can land the aircraft. And, and it's really interesting. Again, uh, you can't tell. Uh, who's going to be able to fly the U-2 and who's not until you put them in the in the airplane. We had, uh, you know, some top-notch test pilots, uh, number one in their class, come in that really just had a, had a lot of trouble flying the U-2. And then we had guys that would barely make it through uh, pilot training but could fly the airplane fantastic. You know, it's really a big metal glider with a jet engine in it, and it lands tailwheel first. It's a, it's, it's a tail dragger, probably, I think, the only yep. tail dragger in the Air Force, certainly yep. only a jet trail dragger. And you have to stall it above the runway to to land. You don't land this airplane. You you it's a controlled stall onto the runway. Yeah, and that's why you have uh, to get down. That's why it takes two pilots to land it, correct? Yeah. Well, yeah. In fact, you can see uh, on my visor on the left side of the screen there, you're looking through this curved piece of plexiglass on your pressure suit, as well as the uh, windscreen on the aircraft. And you're and again, just like in the backseat of the T thirty eight, when you're landing, the nose comes up. You can't see. Uh, directly off the front of the airplane because it's a tail dragger. So, you, you know, and you might be coming back from a 10 hour mission in the middle of the night in a rainstorm and you're looking through two pieces of glass and you're kind of uh, alone inside that pressure suit, which removes a lot of your tactile and oral senses that you normally use to fly an airplane. And you, uh, so it's, it's, it can be a load. And so that's, a, that's why it's important to have a, a second set of eyeballs, a second pilot in the, in the chase car that's calling out your, uh, your distance above the runway and just letting you know how things look and, you know, and whether it's time for you to go around or not. Yeah. And I remember when we would close you guys up, I mean, the mobile would close you up and when we would hook you up in the suit and plug you in and say, see you later in about eight hours. Uh, I noticed that this airplane has a uh, wind line string or what do you call that? Uh, the string that comes up the. Oh, the string, string on the, on the canopy. Yeah. On the canopy. Yeah, a, uh, that's our, that's our high, highly, ex very expensive high tech, uh, <laughs> rudder uh, pedal into yeah if it's that thing's going one way or the other you need to center your rudder pedals and, fit, and get that thing flying yeah. straight, straight and what's the rearview it. mirror for <laughs> i am told that rearview mirror is to actually see if you're leaving a contrail to see if uh if uh, when the uh fighters come up to get you if they can see your contrail no oh, so, yeah yeah because yeah, then so. they could they could possibly find out what your uh what your altitude is if they knew that so Oh, so uh, moving along to the next slide, when you went to you you went through all your survival training as a as a, a T thirty eight and a B fifty two pilot, and then you had to go and uh, do additional training when you got to the U two program. Cause yeah, that's right. It was a, you you go through the normal uh, Air Force survival training, the water survival, land survival, all that. But of course, with the U two, you've got a it's a bit bit different mission. You got the pressure suit. You're flying uh, over uh, areas where you don't normally fly in wartime. Uh, so you've got special survival you have to go through along with the special uh, water survival in the pressure suit. And this is a picture of, uh, of me going through uh, the annual water survival. I think that I, that, that's the lake that's up above Beale there in the mountains with the dam on it. It's uh, actually, we're in a couple hundred feet of water right there. It's, it's kind of, water's kind of cold, which is why the uh, instructor behind me has a wetsuit on and and I've got the, the pressure suit, which actually provides a little, yep. a little, a little bit of protection. Yep. Okay, so... Still, still as happy. Yeah. So this is, as you, as you guys call it, your hero shot. 
the hero shot. Yeah, this I think this was in uh, Saudi Arabia back in the early '90s. Um, we had we had a day where we decided to take some fancy pictures with the flag, and the wind was blowing that one just right. And I'm in the suit with no no ventilation or cooling air, so it's actually deceptively warm inside that suit right now, and it's a good way to break a sweat and lose some weight. Um, Especially with the sun bearing down on you. Yeah. That's on a mission bird here. I think that airplane might have just come back from a from a mission. You can see it's got the electro optical uh, sensor on the nose there, which actually can rotate left and right. So you can look at a target obliquely. You don't have to fly directly over it. Uh, you can rotate the nose oh, to wow. a point at a target. The uh, whole cylinder uh, in front of the the pointy yeah. part. Yeah, wrote... you can actually see the seam there if you look carefully. Yeah, I see two of there's them. A bump, there's a bump on top of the nose, and then right in front of that bump, there's a seam, and that whole that whole thing rotates. Wow, nice. So it can rotate to look to the side of the aircraft out quite a few miles to. Now, let's not tell any. Let's target. not tell any secrets now. Oh, I wouldn't dare. Now, not speaking of me. secrets, I have a I have a picture of a hero shot too, right there in the bottom <laughs> left. Yeah. And uh, yeah. this is, so this first picture, the big picture was from the early 90s. Uh, this next picture is from 2001, almost exactly 20 years ago. Uh, yeah, and, and this actually, is, now, that I, now that I think about it, that big picture actually might have been taken close around the same time as, as that one with you there. Yes. Um, well, your hair yeah, is definitely I'm, longer in the in the big picture. Yeah, and I'm, skin, I'm skinnier too, I, unfortunately. But I but, remember uh, this picture because this picture was your uh, your flight your high flight in Saudi Arabia in 2001 that took you over the thousand hours in the U2. Okay. That, that was your, because I remember that as your thousand hour flight. I'll bet you. I'll bet you you're right. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for that. And I had just mm -hmm. arrived in, uh, at PSAB, Prince, Prince Sultan Air Base. And I think this is, I've told guys the story about this before, but you were the deck commander and I was uh, in operations as uh, I was actually learning the U2 mission. Uh, mm -hmm. So that I could be a certified supervisor, they had all supervisors had to go through training, to for suit training and chamber training, and then we had to go out into one deployment, and then we went back to Beale, and we were we were supervisor qualified. We could deploy with you two. Now, being right. a master sergeant, I I wasn't slated to deploy. I was a training manager, but I had to be deployable because they would have to pull out a hide if we needed to send somebody. I would be tagged to go, but we always had other supervisors that needed to go anyway. So. So this was my one supervisor training deployment for three months to Saudi. Yeah, yeah, and you could see that suit. That's the old version of the pressure suit. I love that one. That was a, a lot different than the newer, yeah, than the newer suit that came out later on. Yeah, and I I heard guys hated the newer suit, and they they wanted to go to the depot and get their older suit, old suit out. They wanted. They said, please go get my old suit. I don't like this suit. And well, you know what was funny is, uh, of course, when I went to the I was in the U two flying from ninety three through ninety seven, and then I went to a staff tour for. A few years uh, over at Ramstein, uh, ground non-flying staff tour. Did that for a few years. Came back to the U2 there in 2000, just like uh, just right before we took that yep. picture. Right. And they were right about able, the time I were, came into the program. Yeah, and they were able to find my old suit that I had used back yeah. in the in the early 90s, and my old boots and, and helmet. And so I was very happy about that. I got the same equipment back. Uh, that I'd had uh, what four or five years earlier. Sure. The, and uh, and so it was. It's important to to a pilot to have have the equipment they're comfortable with. Yeah, I can imagine the. Uh, I mean, it's anything that doesn't distract you for the flight allows you to focus on the mission is kind of crucial. Right. right. So one of the things that was kind of a, it was spinning up as I was there and then I transitioned from military to civilian I retired and I became one of the schedulers in your in your scheduling department uh, yeah this is this is a, the uh, instrument panel of the U2S model which is uh, the, the U2 that we're currently flying still yep and uh, and it's a lot I don't I don't think we have a picture of the R model but it's very no. different very different uh, instrument panel we'll take out and all the glass and put in round gauges or round yeah. dials or yeah. steam gauges they call them a few other things that were changed on that aircraft too the engine uh, is the uh, I believe the same core engine that's in the B2 um, yeah. but they so they put in a new engine they put in a completely new electrical system yeah because the uh, R model uh, used to have the F16 <laughs> engine minus the afterburner I believe. Yeah, and so this is a, this is basically other than the airframe and a new aircraft, and sure. uh, and of course we had to go through the transition between the R model 
and the S model. And I was fortunate enough to be, at the time we started that, to be the uh, chief of Stanaval. And so I got to be one of the first ones that was dual qualified in both those aircraft, in yeah. addition to the T-38. So there was a time there that we were flying essentially three different uh, Air Force aircraft all at the same time. The, yeah. the T-38, the U-2R, and the and the U-2S model. And don't forget the people... U-2T. Oh, the ST. Yeah, the, the, the duals, the, the yeah. two-seater. Did they, the two-seaters, did they upgrade Indeed. those to class right away so they can get more people qualified in them? Uh, yeah, I believe, I believe so. I think that if I remember right, there was one that we upgraded. We had, we of course had one of each for a while or, you know, had both, both versions. Uh, and then ultimately we'd updated, updated all the trainers to the to the S model, because all the students coming through then, we, we made the jump, we're going to be uh, trained just in, in the S model. Well, I remember, pe I remember this. Surprised. People are surprised uh, when I show them this picture of the of the instrument panel, because they don't, uh, they don't realize that the U-2 is actually, uh, was actually a fairly new aircraft at the time. It was based on on an earlier version, you know, the, the Gary Powers, late 50s, early 60s, but, it, but the actual aircraft now that we're flying, they were all built between 1979 and 1989 and, and they're yeah. a much bigger bigger airframe more powerful engine and of course you've got an instrument panel uh, modern day modern uh, state-of-the-art technology on the sensor so it's actually a pretty uh, pretty uh, updated pretty current aircraft compared to what people visualize when they hear you too they automatically think of something 50 years ago which sure really really it's a totally case. different airplane same concept, but completely different technology. Well, I remember this as a civilian scheduler. This was a nightmare because I could only, every month I would have to build with Mo. I, Mo and I would have to build the flight schedule to keep you qualified, keep you current in all your different parameters or your flight profiles. And I remember we it, it's you couldn't just assign. We also did the flight schedule, so we couldn't assign somebody that wasn't our model qualified or S model qualified in an, in an S model airplane, you know, that we had to make sure that that person had already gone through the S upgrade. So we had special identifiers on the pilots and special identifiers on the aircraft to let us oh, know. Oh yeah. And, and I'll tell you what it was, I, I felt really lucky at the time because often when, uh, when they had an opening in the schedule and they couldn't find anybody else, since I was dual qualified, I got the best of both worlds. They'd throw me in and I'd get a free flight, free, free, a free, uh, free flight because I was one of the only ones hanging around that could fly that airplane. <laughs> yep. So this is uh, this is probably uh, around 2003, I think. That's probably a good guess. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, if, if you look at the model of Corvette, that is, and what year model that is, you could tell us what year the, this airship was. This was us. Yeah. Because this was a dealer team. new car, right? Or did you guys yeah. buy this car? No, oh, I wish. This was my, my team and I uh, deployed to, uh, I can't remember where this air show was, but we anyway, we were at an air show and I was scheduled to fly the air show and, and uh, my number two was going to was gonna ch beat, drive the chase car. Well, then they they uh, pulled up with this car and said, hey, you want to use this as a chase car? And it was <laughs> yeah. one, of the local, one of the local dealers wanted to advertise his new, uh, yeah. new model Corvette. And I said, why, sure, we'll be happy to use that as a chase car. And I told my number two, how would you like to fly the air show and I'll be the chase driver? Oh, you switched. So, what did, yeah, so rank, rank did, has its privileges. So, so what did you use for radios? Was, did you have a portable, portable uh, yeah, radio? We just, had a, we just had a handheld, I think, that we yeah. were using at that point. You know, if you, um, if you guys that are watching, if you go out there on YouTube and Google search the U2 landing, you'll see tons of uh, videos out there of the chase cars, all the way back to like the El Caminos in the old days. Right going out and a lot of people used to say oh that car goes out there and puts the pogo in i said no 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 that would that would be amazing if they could do it had anybody ever tried to do that uh, i don't think so i i, I don't that would I be just can't that would, that'd be a nightmare that, that wouldn't work well i mean there have been times when we've had to go out and assist the uh the pogo crew with uh, lifting the wing or you know retrieving the pogo i suppose but yeah you not 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 in the car i i got a ride on a u2 once on a U on a U two airplane, <laughs> on the wing. On the wing, I uh, yeah. came down. You know, remember at PSAP, we had the the raised turtle shell lighting in the center line, right? And so you couldn't you couldn't taxi on center line; it would tear up the back wheel caster. Yeah, yeah. And the so tail had, wheel there is just it's not inflated; it's just hard rubber like a tricycle tire. Yeah, it almost looks like urethane skateboard tire to me. That's exactly what it is. Yep. And and so you have to you if you if you you will bend that caster; it's aluminum, high grade aluminum. But it's you'll you'll bend that or you'll break off the rubber that's on there if you hit these. Yeah, they're, basically, yeah. they're like little manhole covers in the yeah, runway. Yeah, it'll take take the rubber right off that. Uh, so wheel, yeah. 
we used to, you guys, we would plug in a pogo on one side and you would taxi with that side. You would basically have your main gear to the opposite side of the center line and that would be offset of the uh, apron. And the wing, the free wing, would be out there hanging over the, the, the side lighting or the edge lighting. Right, and right. so three of us would get on the wing. It was a nice ride too because the wing was still cold from being at altitude. So we got, uh, you know, it's 120 degrees and we've got air conditioning. I almost felt like I needed some extra padding because my hands were freezing holding on to the wing well and, and the u2 it only that tail wheel only turns about seven uh seven degrees seven and a half degrees either side of center line so it's it doesn't have a real tight turn radius so learning to taxi the u2 is actually a fairly it's a, a steep learning curve and takes a while to learn to master because you aren't going to be able to turn as tight as you can with other aircraft and there is no so, reverse to back up and do a three point no, 20 no, point road turn the, and it's and if you haven't if you're a U2 pilot and you haven't had to get a push, you know push back to try to start again. Well, I don't think you've been in the program that long. Yeah. It's almost everybody's ultimately going to have to, you know, screw up a turn and they're going to get they're going to have to have the have them push the airplane to, backwards to try again. And so you're saying around. you're saying there are those that have done it and those that will do it. Those that have and those that will. So the other black jet that you flew at Beal, uh, yeah. with the companion, what they call this companion trainer or just a proficiency the, jet? What, you, what the is this? The companion trainer, because you didn't get to fly the U2 very often, you know, maybe a, as an experienced U2 pilot, you might get to fly once or twice a week. Yeah. Uh, they had this companion trainer that you could keep your skills current yeah. and go up and fly and instruments, and like, uh, approaches, yeah. takeoffs, landings, flight time. Yeah. And it's of course a lot cheaper to operate. We it was kind of the best of both worlds, and I was really lucky having going to Beale as a T thirty eight instructor already. I uh, just jumped right in to, uh, to, uh, to quick the recall. Program. Yeah, and I could could fly both seats of the T thirty eight at Beale as well, and instructed the new guys that coming into the into Beale. Uh, I would also instruct them and teach them how to fly the T thirty eight. And at well. this point, and, these were C's or B's. Uh, a, T38, a still A's. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I still, I don't, I don't know if uh, we'd have to ask. I don't know if they've ever gone to the C model or not. But yeah, T thirty eight A. Yeah, because the uh, same as they the same as we had at pilot training base, identical. Boy, these these look like MiG twenty eights. Nobody's been this close before. You you know the uh, this this picture is amazing. Um, you know you got oh, that's a, at, it looks like that's a cross country. Beale. Is this at Beale? Yeah. Down oh yeah, yeah down by the first RS parking ramp. Yeah, that's where they used to keep them. I think they actually have shelters now that they put them in. But at the time, we parked them down at the down at the end of the airfield there, and uh, and yeah, we we go out. Sometimes we put a there's an external pod you can put on the bottom of the aircraft that you could put your stuff in if you were going. Yeah, to travel pod. And you could go two ship, or sometimes we even go four ship. Yeah, because you guys would uh, sometimes use this to to go to like air shows with and stuff. You'd, you'd... Uh, occasionally, yeah. If we if they, we bring both the U two or the T and or the T thirty eight to the air show. Yeah, this is a this was fun. We had a we had a uh, actually a route that we'd fly that would take us over San Francisco Bay on what we called the Bay Tour. The Bay Tour. And, I remember hearing about this, that. This is a two ship obviously and actually that's that's me in the back seat and a friend of mine snapped this photo of us going over the Golden Gate Bridge uh, on the Bay Tour. As long as we stayed uh, I think below a thousand feet or below 1500 feet uh air traffic control and uh and norcal was hap norcal approach was happy with us and we just drive right up the bay over alcatraz and hang a left and head up the bay there and then go back to beale yeah were you in any uh corridors there uh bfr corridors oh, yeah. There's a, there's a, I think they actually have space that you can do the Bay Tour, and you got to watch out for the helicopters and other small aircraft. Yeah, GA aircraft do that same and, thing. And now, is this the Grand Canyon? Up. Yeah, yeah, that's the Grand Canyon, and of course, nice. we're up high enough to stay out of the, uh, yeah. the minimum the, the no 2,000 feet over the, over the, yeah. any preserve or national park. Yep, that looks good. Yeah. But you, sure, you know, again, it's, a, it was, a, the, the, the U2 program certainly had its perks, and, and being able to take the T 38s out and, and, keep your skills current and go cross country and see views like this was, was definitely one of them. And I uh, certainly have no regrets about, uh, about being able to fly that airplane. Yeah. I see that's the wing bird. It's got the ninth RW on it. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's the, so you fly a different oh. airplane now. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, I, actually after, um, after flying the U2, I went to a staff job and did that for seven more years uh, before I retired from the Air Force. Yeah, total of thirty years federal service. I, I think believe. it was. Oh, I got I got thirty five years federal service. 30, actually, thirty five total. Twenty 
28 years, uh, almost 28 years in the military active duty, I retired in 2011. And then I got hired by NATO as a civilian. And I did that as a, I was a GS-14 DOD and also a NATO civilian uh, working for NATO for another seven years. And that was over uh, in Brussels? Uh, Brussels, Luxembourg, and then also uh, three years in Afghanistan. Oh, wow. And, and uh, uh, ultimately decided to come back to home to the States, retire. And uh, I was just going to get my uh, CFI, CFII, and be, a, be an instructor. But uh, one of the guys I flew with had some other ideas and said, well, why don't you go uh, be an airline pilot? And I hadn't thought about that. And, of course, Alaska and Horizon fly right out of Seattle. Which oh, we, too far. yeah, we live in the we live in the zone there. That's yeah. that's that's so our airline we use of choice. It's it's not far for me to drive from my home. And they were we were just bringing these uh, Embraer 175s online at the time I got hired. And uh, you know, since I'd flown jets all my life, I was happy to say, hey, I can fly that. Yeah. And uh, they hired me, and I've been uh, flying the E175 now since 2017, and it's a great airplane. This is amazing the the cleanliness of this aircraft. I mean, the, you can tell these are fresh air. What do you think these are? These airframes are two years old, maybe. Yeah, we well we started getting them in 2017, and we're still we're going to get uh, nine more new aircraft here within the next year or two. So it's still we've been getting them ever since. Yeah. And I like to tell people this is the very first airplane I've ever flown that was actually designed and built in the 21st century. So uh, it's it's an amazing airplane, uh, extremely well designed. Uh, it's essentially a computer with wings. I should say it's five computers with wings. Yeah, that um, yoke just, assembly looks like you're riding a crotch rocket. You know, it looks like yeah, a drag racing. Bike. Yeah, I joke that I joke that we should put tassels on the end of those yokes <laughs> and make it look like a big wheel. Uh, you know, but, they actually uh, look like uh, they look like lady shoes without the heels. You, you you know, it's funny. You get used to it. It, it actually uh, after you first you think, oh, I'm never going to be able to fly this thing with that strange looking yoke. But honestly, it it. It ergonomically, it makes sense. Uh, I'm I'm used to it now, and I, from either seat, and it's a, uh, it's not a bad design. I can understand why they did it. Of course, uh, you know, a guy like me, I always like to say I like to fly with a stick. Ultimately, yeah. if I could, I'd choose a stick. But but is it, but for a yoke, I actually I can I, I prefer this yoke to the traditional. Quite frankly, you know, I was going to ask you. Uh, I'm looking at all the switches. You've got a lot of controls thrown over to the yoke. Uh, a lot more than you know the early early airline days. Um, are you able to kick off the autopilot there and able to do comms yeah, there? Yeah, see the big red button there on yep. the left side? That's, that's the disengage. That kicks, that kicks off the autopilot. It's also got another unique feature. There's a black button just below and to the right of that. You see that one? That mm -hmm. button, if, if you push it, it temp as long as you're holding it and you're pushing it, it temporarily disengages the autopilot. Oh, so, so you, you, can, so you, you can, can change altitudes? So you can, yeah, you can maneuver the aircraft yep. to make it more what you want, and then you can release it and re-engage. So you don't have to go through the whole process of pushing buttons to re-engage the autopilot. That just temporarily releases it, so you can have control, which is kind of a cool, uh, cool feature. Yeah, we and have that, that in the in the F-16 in DCS world. The uh, we have the paddle switch, which doesn't turn off the autopilot; just it interrupts it while we change altitudes, and then we can return it back on. Right. Or just the release it and then re-engages. Right. It's it's very similar to that. Uh, the button just above the uh, autopilot button there is a, is the radio. Just push to talk. Yeah, it looks and, like a almost looks like a multi-position hat switch with with it texture. Is, it is. It is. One one is a, it mutes the hot mic, and the other one is push to talk. And then of course to the the far left is the trim. Yeah. Uh, and then and then the one on the right side is just a chronometer there that you can start to start and stop the clock if you need to. Yeah, this looks really amazing. You've got uh, so two engines. Uh, really clean cockpit i mean I, I would love to fly now you have the the data entry in the center console there you've got two data entry points there yeah and are they flip the, yeah those are that's the mcdu the uh, mission can i think mission control data unit is what it stands for it's part of the fms flight management system and uh, actually that is probably one of the most complicated systems on the aircraft i'm actually still learning stuff about that system it's made by honeywell uh, and it, uh, it it's pretty pretty uh, complex. It's it works for fairly well, um, but there's all sorts of features that uh, come in a. You can read about it in about a three or four hundred page book if you're if sure. you need something to put put you to sleep. Uh, written by engineers, not pilots. But uh, but that's uh, yeah, that's the heart and soul of the of the aircraft right there. How much do you have overhead? Uh, I didn't give you an overhead shot, did I? Um, no. They gave us a wave there. Oh yeah, that's uh, 
Hello. You're, it looks like you're at pushback somewhere that's right at sunset or sunrise. Yeah, yeah. I love mornings sun. in the airplane. Yeah, it's my favorite time to fly as well. And you can see we've got the logo light on there with the Eskimo on the tail. Yeah. Uh, the overhead is primarily aircraft systems uh, that you you know control. You've got uh, you've got the pressure panel, the electrical panel, engines, obviously the uh, fire fire suppression. Yeah. Uh, high, uh, so all all the the standard systems you would expect. It's it's a very clean panel as well. Uh, if we do another one of these, I'll try to get a picture for you. We sure. can bring that in. It's, yeah, I definitely think we're going to have some follow-on episodes for sure. Very simple, elegant design, and uh, this the whole flight deck is designed to be uh, dark and quiet. So you really shouldn't have to do anything, and there shouldn't be any erroneous lights on unless there's a problem. So it's uh, it's very it's very it makes a lot of sense. Um, you really don't have to mess with anything unless there's something out of the ordinary, which I really like, and it. It's all very smooth and logical. You know, you don't. Looks have, like it's really soft on the eyes too. Yeah. Well, and you can adjust that. Of course, you've got uh, rheostats that you can uh, adjust the lighting up and down. In one of the but, previous pictures, you sh it showed your electronic flight books. Both you and the co-pilot have it, and uh, right. or the first officer. And yeah, you don't have to. It, you know, the days of carrying this giant pubs bag around are gone. We just have an iPad that's got everything on it. All the jet plates. Uh, all the. All the. Uh, uh, you know, either for flight or, uh, the, you know, others, whatever you want on that, along with all your, uh, your pubs and your, uh, uh, your, you've got moving map and all sorts of other features. And there's of course a Wi-Fi now in the jet that you can use to kind of interface yeah. uh, with, the, with all that going on, the weather, the, you know, uh, you've got, uh, uh, different features that will update the weather in flight and all that. Yeah. So it's actually pretty, pretty cool compared to the days when we first started flight training and we had the, uh, you know, the, the cross checks and, uh, that made no sense in airplanes with steam gauges that were thrown here and there. This is all very uh, slick and elegant. Yeah, you can tell that. when you can tell when something doesn't match up in this. Now, does the, the EFBs, do they talk to the jet at all? Uh, not really, not yet. Uh, not so I noticed you just not, had them mounted and you just have a, a charger port to keep them yeah, keep them alive. It, yeah, it'll, it'll charge it and there's a Wi-Fi system on board the aircraft that you can access, uh, you know, what you need to while you're flying. But uh, there really isn't any uh, communication between the jet, other than the Wi-Fi, between the jet and the, the systems on the jet and the and the uh, iPad, which may be a good thing because you've basically got an independent uh uh, an independent source of information there that if things on the jet go bad, you still got, uh, you sure. still got your iPad. That's nice that um, you don't have to, it's, you know, in the, in the paper days, keeping those things up to date was such a pain. Yeah. A lot of it will update automatically on its own or before you start a trip, uh, you'll just uh, sync everything up and it'll update the charts uh, and pubs automatically. Yeah. So you're still a pretty young guy and, and you've got quite a few years right, still you. left to fly. <laughs> I don't ever see you not flying. I think by the, you know, when, when it's the airline relative. says, okay, what's that? I said, it's all relative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I, I know you and I were born in the same year, so I can't say too much about age, but uh, I think one of the, one of the things, I mean, there are, I remember going through instrument commercial ground school right around the time the huge furloughs happened after September 11th. So the the time, you know, I was turning 40, the cutoff for ATP was 60 at that time. Yeah. And then we had this huge shortage of pilots where the FAA changed the rules, allowed people to stay to 65. And yeah. I don't regret not finishing the, uh, the air, air traffic or ATP, uh, air, airline transport pilot certification. I don't regret that because I'm actually glad I didn't have to go and get another job that I had to lead my family uh, into. I went I went a different way with aviation, and that's for a different episode. This is mostly about you and your transition in your career, um, but you're looking, you know, you're looking at, uh, unless they change the rules, you're looking at about another seven years of active flying. And then after that, yeah. ooh, there's a good shot of Seattle right there, but, but after that, you've got something else in mind that you're going to do. Well, seven years of fly, uh, commercial flying, of course, 121, part 121. After that, you could still do contract and, uh, and uh, you know, instruct or whatever. But, yeah, this is my uh, this is my favorite hobby here, sailing. I love to sail. And, uh, and actually, uh, there's a lot of commonalities between uh, sailing and, and flying. The sail is a wing, and a wing is a sail. And if you know how to do one, you kind of know how to do the other. And I yeah. enjoy getting out on the water and... Uh, 
and just taking it easy and using the wind to power a, you know, a heavy vessel right along the water. Sure. Well, I think that brings us to the end of this part of the episode. Uh, we're going to do some follow-ups. You're currently at my house right now on another computer in another room, and we are we we've we've been uh, spending about the last 36 hours together, going out and seeing some sites, going for some for some walks and doing stuff. But I think I think we're going to hook up and do a couple more episodes uh, on various things, some things that we might want to share, and I'll put some links into the description down below. But you you tell me something that I'm sharing with all my commercial pilot buddies. Uh, that are commercial rated that the airlines are hiring oh i'll tell you what the pendulum has swung you know during COVID, of course they were laying people off furloughs early retirements it's gone the opposite way now uh and all the airlines will be hiring um I, my airline that i'm flying for horizon I, I know we're trying to get i think 300 pilots within the next uh, six to eight months and uh, I, I know we, we kind of did an informal tally of how many pilots are going to be required for all the majors over the next year, and it's well over 7,000. So I think this is the best time I've ever seen to get into the uh, aviation industry if you want to be an airline pilot. Sure. Uh, it's, uh, they're, 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 they're not going to be able to find all, uh, enough people, so it's going to be pretty cutthroat, I think, in the industry over the next, uh, at least for the rest of this year. It, we're definitely back to uh, pre-pandemic levels, and... Uh, and uh, it's going to be crazy this summer and into the fall. You know, I I, th- I think that I believe in this that there is a um, there is a bubble uh, in the retirement bubble of the baby boomers. And you and I, I looked this up in the dictionary. We're the other last two baby boomers. Uh, the baby boomers from 1946 to 1964, and. Uh, those as those baby boomers that are in the airline start there's there's this huge representation of the population of pilots that are in the boomer age as soon as those yeah. start rolling in and our our age starts to get out and retire that's going to open up so many slots uh, so yeah. if any yeah. of you guys are thinking about a career in aviation if you're young enough or if you're transitioning you know middle military career or just even you know want something different to do and you still have a few years to fly uh, I would definitely look into it uh, well and I'll tell you what you know we talked about my career path which was through the military but there's there's so many other ways to do it uh, most of the guys I fly with were not military. Um, some of them, I, I've flown with some 22, 23-year-old people that just finished, uh, you know, either Embry-Riddle or one of the other uh, aviation schools. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they're they're in debt, but they're going to pay it off, uh, just like being a doctor, I suppose. You, you know, you're going to go, you're going to have to uh, fork out some money to get the certifications. But now they're a first officer flying for an airline, and their future looks very bright. I mean, not necessarily uh, staying with. Uh, horizon but uh, you know get, getting your uh, experience there and then moving on to a major that's perfectly acceptable a lot of people do that and uh, boy I'll tell you what uh, if you get your commercial instrument rating and get a few hours they're going to definitely take a serious look at you and it's time to get into the industry yeah I, t- I tell you I've heard a lot about the um, the apprehension of going into the airlines because of the the seniority thing and the pay at first but that period where you're starting out and you're basically in probation that moves really fast you get move you if you apply yourself and stay competent in the job you move up pretty fast and you start making a decent pay a lot sooner than airline pilots used to yeah it, it is it's tough the first year um but you do move up and especially at uh, at a regional like like horizon because people are always uh, coming and going so you're, you move up the seniority ladder pretty darn quick there sure uh and it's and you're right it's it's just a, a matter of time before you upgrade to captain and then uh, if you want to move on to a major of course there's no time like the present to do that i think every single major's uh hiring right now including uh including uh you know fedex ups or the cargo carriers if that's what you want to do sure and if you guys anybody that's listening to the show right now uh, when this comes out, we're, re- we're pre-recording this. This will be out in a few days. But anybody that's listening to this wants to get more information, just drop us a line in the comments. We'll be, I'll get with Walt and we'll get back with you. Uh, I am going to put a few links on how to get to the Horizon hiring site uh, to go check that out. And uh, we're both here to answer questions. We've got other people in the Air Warfare Group that are also commercial pilots or commercially rated pilots that uh, would be glad to chime in. So that usually if you ask that question, you'll get responses right away. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to answer any further questions we just kind of scratched the surface today of a lot of different topics and there's there's a lot of different in-depth stories that go with each of those topics we talked yeah. about yeah we're going to talk more war stories uh together uh in future episodes and stuff so i am going to sign us off here thanks for coming 
thanks for sure. coming down to, to spend. Uh, you, you actually took an extra day to come down to Portland to start a trip that starts in a few hours. And yeah. so we've got to get you to the airport here in a few. Uh, but the uh, I want to just say it's been a real joy to uh, to get back in contact with you over the last year. Uh, we've done some, we're getting ready to do some backpacking together. We did a little bit of backpacking last year. Uh, I've been up and met your wife and stayed at your house. You've come down and met my family and stayed at my house. And you got to meet my dog. And yeah. and she she approves. Oh, I fell in love. I fell in love with your dog. I think I might take your dog with me. Well, I'll send you <laughs> lots of pictures to show to your wife to see if you can convince her. Uh, yeah, I tell you, talk her into getting a dog. Well, there's two. two it's a double edged sword. If you get a puppy, there. Yes, you get to train that puppy. But the other edge of that sword is you've got to deal with that puppy. <laughs> yeah, I got to so. figure out how to, how to convince the company to let me take the puppy with me on trips. That would be something. Yeah, you, you can't do the seeing eye dog. I think you have to have two eyes to be a pilot. So, Well, well hey, thank you very much, Juice. This was sure. great, and I appreciate you hosting awesome. me here. We had a great time. It's kind of I a had a blast. Vacation. Yeah, we'll, we'll do some more. We'll definitely stay in touch and do some more stuff. So, guys, that's going to c- conclude the episode. Uh, again, if you like this and want to stay in touch with the channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And if you like the video and want to share it, uh, like, hit that like button and then copy the link or hit share the video and send it out there. The, uh, like I said, we don't do this for profit. We don't, we're not raising money here. We just want to get the passion for aviation shared throughout the community. It's not only about DCS. It's not only about military air av- aviation. It's about aviation in general, primarily as it's based to air warfare. And from two air warfare specialists or air warfare experts, and sitting in Oregon right now. Have a good day, everybody. Be safe, and we'll talk to you later. Goodbye, Walt. See you later. Cheers.